come and uh, watch God's hand on Greg's life and uh, love the whole family. They're a blessing to this body. They're a blessing to this church. And uh, I believe that Greg's got a message for us tonight. And he's going to be talking about Christian leadership. And so I want to encourage you to, to pay attention. Greg, just allow God to use you. Allow him to speak through you. Allow him to minister through you. Because I see the hand of God on your life, Greg. And I want to, I just want to bring you in and uh, allow you to, to speak God's word to us. And congregation, let's be, let's just allow God to, to mold our hearts as Brother Greg comes to share. Thank you. Lord, we pray that you'd be glorified in this place, Lord. We pray that you'd be glorified in our lives, dear God. Come in power, Holy Spirit. We invite you into this place. We invite you into our hearts. Touch our hearts, Lord. Change us. Change us. Change us. We yield to you as clay in the potter's hand. As clay in the potter's hand. And Lord, we give you permission to purify us, to cleanse us to remove, remove those impurities, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm gonna speak this evening on the joys of Christian leadership. And I see smiles on the front row because um, it's not always joyful in Christian leadership. Um, however, as you'll see tonight in the Word, that is what the Word says, is that there is joy in Christian leadership. There are joys in our trial. And we are to count it joy. It's to be enjoyable. We are to be in the joy of the Lord as we lead. And we're going to see tonight that there's a call of God on each of us. As Christians, we are all leaders. If you're in the nursery, you're leading children. If you're on the worship stand, you're leading worship. If you're ushering, you're leading people into the presence of God. If you're in prayer, you're leading. You're leading your words to the kingdom of God. You're leading in a spiritual realm. You have dominion. As you, as you approach God in prayer, you have dominion. You are in a position of leadership. Each of us in our Christian walk is in a position of leadership. And so this, is, this message is applicable to everyone. One of the joys of Christian leadership is that Satan's master plan is to smite the shepherd and the sheep will fall. He doesn't really want to chase sheep and eat sheep and be chased away by the shepherd. That's not his plan. His plan is to smite the shepherd and take the sheep. And we need to be very cognizant of that as Christian leaders. That he's after us. And we're going to see as, as we look through the word this evening and the next several evenings, uh, the next several Wednesdays, how Satan has attacked. And we'll look through the Bible, each of the leaders he's attacked in different ways and and by looking through these uh these uh, uh joyful experiences of uh, the christian saints the hall of fame uh as uh, as they're laid out in uh in hebrews uh we can see the master plan of, of satan and how he attacks us and the bible tells us to be wary of the devil and to be very aware of his plans and so if someone's going to attack you and you're not aware of it it's really hard to have a defense but if you're aware of the techniques, the tactics, the places that he attacks you, then you can be prepared and you can arm yourself with the armament of God, both offensive and defensive. And then lastly, uh, we're going to look at, uh, at uh, the, the joy and the, the magnificent uh, power that comes with obedience from God. So that's it. It's going to take, I have three Wednesdays that we're going to work through this. There's quite a bit of information um, that, uh, that we're going to cover. So... Uh, uh, we're going to start out, if you could, uh, honey, uh, the first slide. Um, we're going to start out in, oh, okay. The winner prints backwards. Page 11 is up front. I just thought I was prepared to ask you. Okay, so we're going to start out in Zechariah chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. 
And uh, Zechariah is, uh, if you find Matthew, you can turn back two books. So it's right in front of Malachi. And uh, this is a verse that uh, in my daily wash, Pastor, uh, I got stuck on. Uh, and that's a problem. Last year we went through the, the one-year Bible with devotions. Uh, and well, long about uh, uh, August time frame, I got stuck. And I spent about six weeks in Zechariah 10, verses 1 through 3. And I couldn't get out of it. In the first three weeks, I didn't know what God was telling me, but I couldn't move on. Um, and the word that, the word that is, uh, is uh, spoken through Zechariah here is a very passionate one. Uh, and it speaks about God's passion for us, uh, not just as leaders, but for the sheep. And you'll see that his desire for us is that we would bear much fruit. And let's take a look at the word. Uh, verse 1, it says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Verse 2, for the idols have spoken vanity and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, they went their ways as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds. Oh, help us, Lord. And I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, and the house of Judah has made them as his goodly horse in battle. Lord, help us. Lord, illuminate your word tonight, Lord. Quicken your word, Lord. Make it alive. Make it keen in our minds and lively in our hearts, Lord. Illuminate it, Lord, as only your Holy Spirit can truly show us the, the power in the word. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 1, we see, uh, uh, Ask ye of the Lord. And this is a phrase we've seen many, many times in the Bible. Um, so we, we have not because we ask not, right? And, and who's supposed to ask here? Are we supposed to wait for someone else to ask? He's speaking to us and he's saying, ask. Ask of the Lord. And if Pastor Jim was here with his Jewish Bible, he would point out that that is Jehovah. Jehovah. Uh, that is the uh, uh, unpronounceable uh, word of uh, uh, with uh, no syllables, which comes from the uh, the, the root word Haya. Uh, 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 you have Chaya, which is life. Haya means uh, uh, a form of being. It's, it's like the form of be in English. And, and who knows the forms of be? Who remembers that from English? There's uh, I and R and am and uh, several others, uh, all the personal pronouns, those are all forms of be. And they're all words to describe an eternal existence, a state of being. And so, so God, God's name is telling us about a God who is the beginning, who is the end, who is forever, past, present, future, beginning of time, end of time, uh, the one end of the universe, the other end of the universe. He is all those things, all at the same time. And this is the uh, uh, when uh, 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 Abraham asked or uh, or Moses asked God, and he said, uh, uh, "Who shall I tell them has sent me?" He said, "I am that I am." That's Haya. He said, "He said my name is Haya Haya." And it, 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 when the, when the, something is repeated twice in the Bible, it's for emphasis. And he says, "Haya Haya." He says, "I am in being. I am in being." essence of me I exist I exist forever complete eternal so this is this is the God so this is who we're asking of ask ye of haya haya in the time of the latter rain um, the latter rain is uh, a term that's used uh, four or five times in scripture uh, it's an agricultural term uh, and I learned all about the latter rain when we lived in Nebraska and I had a long drive and I watched the corn grow and the cycles and the rain. Uh, and uh, latter rain occurs, uh, the former rain occurs, you put a seed in the ground, the former rain comes uh, and the seed sprouts up into a plant. That's the former rain. If you have no former rain, the seed will sit in the ground nearly forever. Uh, the latter rain occurs uh, after the plant is up. And if there is no latter rain, the plant will not bear fruit. They have big, beautiful leaves, a nice stalk, and no fruit. So the latter rain must happen in order for there to be a harvest. And uh, really, to understand this term, you have to look at it in the context. And there's 
uh, two contexts for this. Uh, one is in the Old Testament, Joel 2.23, and the other in James uh, 5.7. So let's flip over to Joel 2.23. Okay, Joel 2.23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain of the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And so uh, let's flip now to uh, uh, James chapter 5. Seven. And uh, this is nice when the New Testament uh, interprets the old for us. We really don't have to guess on the meaning. As you'll see, it becomes quite clear because uh, to those of us who are no longer in a uh, agrarian uh, culture, uh, the terms are, are kind of puzzling. So James uh, chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband, husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Uh, in this verse, we see that uh, he's talking about the harvest. And... The latter rain, you remember, is required for the harvest. Without the latter rain, there is no harvest. Uh, and so the latter rain speaks of reaping souls. The former rain uh, is the time where the seed comes, right? And the seed has the entire power of the plant in it. And the rain, the Holy Spirit, unlocks that seed and it comes forth and bears a plant. So when we are born again in Christ, uh, the seed that lives in us, right? The power of God lives in us. That's unlocked by the Holy Spirit, and we then bear a plant. With no latter rain, uh, you know, we bear no fruit, which is, as Christians, we're supposed to then go and share the gospel with other people who then have what, what comes on the, the, the fruit? Their seed. Only is it one seed? No, it's 30, 60, 100 fold. And that's, that's the fruit that we, are, as Christians, are supposed to bear. And it is that latter rain. It, the former rain is nice. Anyone remember the former rain when you were born again? I had a, one of those charismatic, Holy Ghost, born again experiences. Uh, and it was great. And I wish I could have lived in that. And the power of God was on me. Uh, and I, I uh, budded up into a nice plant. Uh, and for years, I did nothing. I had no latter rain in my life. Uh, and when the latter rain came in my life, I, uh, I bore fruit and I began to share the gospel and uh, I, I saw new seeds created from that. So um, so let's look now back at the, our original text now that we understand this concept of the latter rain. It says, ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So he's talking about the harvest and here in James 5, 7, he's talking about be patient therefore under the coming of the Lord. Because the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and he had long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. And if you remember back in Joel 23, uh, the prophecy of Joel said that we'll see the early and the latter rain together. And he's talking about the end time. And here it's made clear. Uh, this, is, this is referencing Joel 23, James 5, 7. And so you have the early and the latter rain coming together. So in the case of my life, for example, I had the early rain. Hooray, I'm born again, right? Uh, what, and then it was years before I had the latter rain. The plant sat, it 
got withered, it got the leaves knocked off of it, it had to grow new leaves, it had scars all over it, uh, but when the latter rain came, it bore fruit. What these scriptures are telling us, in the end time, as the husband, as the, in the time of the coming of the Lord, in James 5, 7, we're going to see the former and the latter rain together. So that if someone is born again, they then bear fruit. And we see not a not what's going on right now where we uh, we reproduce uh, Christians at the rate of 1.05 uh, for every one that's born. Uh, we're going to see like popcorn, right? We're going to see them explode. We're going to see people born again, who wait 30, 60, 100 to be born again. Who we 30, 60, 100 to be born again? That's what this prophecy is telling us. That's the sign of the coming of the Lord. That's that popcorn effect. We're going to see it explode. We're going to see, and it's the former and the latter rain. So what's going to bring that on? Let's look at the verse again. Ask ye of the Lord, rain. He's telling us, ask for rain. He's saying, Holy Spirit, rain. And the purpose of the rain in the time of the latter rain is to bear fruit. And let's move on. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. He's not going to give us a little bit of rain. His spirit is going to pour out. Yeah. It's going to get poured out. And when it pours out, we're going to see 30, 60, wonderful explosions over and over and over. Yeah. It's going to get dark and it's going to get light. And there's not going to be gray as we approach the end time. And as pastors explained previously, we believe we're in the end times. We're in good company though because Jesus and uh, the uh, Apostle Paul also believed they were in the end times. So um, it is it is the right posture before God is to be ready. We are to be ready at all times uh, and the signs of his coming are here uh, and so uh, we are to ask for this rain. How's it going to come? It's right here. Ask ye the Lord for the rain. This is a commandment. As we are, we are to pray that the rain, the Holy Spirit power of God will come and that it would cause those seeds to grow up in the plants and that the latter rain would come. Not just new souls, but that they would then uh, produce more fruit that would, that would bear, bear much fruit in that exponential uh, fashion that we talked about. Showers of rain and to everyone grass of his field. God's will for us is that we have much fruit. God's will is that our fields be beautiful fields of grass, not dry and parched land. His will for us is that we bear much fruit, each of us. That's Holy Spirit's will. And the key is in the front of us now. Ask. We're to ask. We have not because we ask. Amen. 1 2. Boy, if we could just stay in verse 1, Pastor. I like verse 1. Anyone like verse 1? <laughs> verse 1 is good. <laughs> For the idols have spoken vanity. We live in a world that is full of distractions. The enemy is all around us. We get pulled. I, I don't know about you, but my life is all about distractions. I have radio, and I have kids, and I have work. And it's all pulling my attention away from... Verse 1. And we end up doing verse 1 in our spare time, which is not much in Loudoun County, Virginia. Uh, the idols have spoken vanity. So the idols in our age, this present age, deceit and distraction. And uh, I believe it's, it's, it's an institution of Satan. I believe God's agenda is in verse 1. He wants our fields to be full of grass. I think the world, as the word says, the world is the distraction. I mean, the world is not our focus. We are not of this world. And we should be about the Father's business. And I believe the vast majority of our world is Satan's business. And that's a tough word. That's a tough word, but I believe, I believe it's true. And that's what verse 2 tells us. The idols have spoken vanity. The diviners have seen a lie. They have told false dreams. They have comforted in vain. They had went their way as the flock were troubled because there was no shepherd. So we see the world that we live in drawn away to, to, the, to these distractions of Satan. And why are they drawn away? There was no shepherd. God help us. 
God, help us if we have the call of God on our life and we do nothing. Thank you, Jesus. Furthermore, Satan keenly understands that if he's to be successful, he has to take down the Christian leadership. He cannot win. He knows he can't win. Our weapons are superior. The Holy Spirit bears the fruit. All we have to do is yield to the Holy Spirit. However, his tactic is to set these distractions up for the sheep, right? And then take the shepherd. And that's really the, the core of this message is we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of it. We need to understand Satan's plan uh, because the, the consequence is not good. Let's look at verse 3. My anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I have punished the goats. God is passionate about us. He loves his people. You talked about, Pastor, what makes God cry. His will is that none would perish, but all would have eternal life. But most of us are perishing. That's what makes God cry. And not only does it make him cry, it makes him angry. And we in America, in the American church, don't talk much about God's anger, but it's here. It's very real. And he calls those who are causing this to happen goats. And uh, that has to do with the, uh, the, the final accounting where he divides the sheep on one side and the goats on the other. And I grew up in Houston, Texas. And you, uh, if you grew up in Houston, Texas, you learned some Spanish. And uh, the Spanish you learn in Houston, Texas is not good Spanish. First, first you learn all the bad words. <laughs> and uh, I, I found out early, you need to find out what those bad words mean. So somebody called me a cabron. And that was a funny, you know, hey, cabron, hey, cabron. And uh, that's a bad word in Spanish. What's cabron? It's goat. They're calling you a goat. Why are they calling you a goat? They're saying you're going to hell. You're sitting, you're going to hell. And God's calling them goats. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock in the house of Judah. God's people are dear to him. This is his flock. He owns the sheep. We just take care of them. We make sure they're safe. We make sure they have water of the Holy Spirit and the food of the Word. And he hath made them his goodly horse in battle. So the souls that come through this uh, former and latter reign coming together. That's going to be his army in the final battle, as we see in the Revelation. The other thing that's in verse 3 that is very difficult for us as leaders to wrestle in our mind, if we deny the call of Christ on our life and we refuse his call, we deserve the wrath of God. And that's a tough word. Um, John 3.16 talks about the anger of God coming on the children of disobedience. However, I thank God that Jesus Christ took that He took that wrath for us. And probably most of us in this room at one time or the other deserve that wrath. And he took that on us. He took that for us. He took that on the cross. He took our punishment, past, present, future, on the cross. Nonetheless, how should we act? Should we then ignore the call and say, well, Jesus has covered my wrath, Pastor. We're putting that wrath on him. God forbid, God forbid that we should put that wrath on him. He doesn't deserve it. He laid his life down for us. He was the perfect ship. And he asked us to be like him. Okay, well, let's go to uh, the next slide. I've talked about this a little bit in the introduction uh, about leadership, um, and we're gonna we're gonna go to Matthew 22 uh, verses 2 through 14, uh, which in essence tell us that we are all called to Christian leadership. And it says, "The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, which which made a marriage for his son." 
and he sent forth his servant to call them that were bidden to the wedding, but they would not come. Then again he sent for other servants, saying, Tell them which were bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat men, they're killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and they went their way, one to his farm and another to his, his business. And the, the rest, they took his servant, and they treated him spitefully, and they killed him. But when the king heard of it, he was angry, and he sent forth his armies. He destroyed those murderers, and he burned up their city. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden are not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both good and bad. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And the king came to see the guest. There he saw a man who had not on his wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither not having a, a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king unto the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away. Cast him into the outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. We're all called to Christian leadership. We all receive that invitation to the wedding. Some of, some of us of Jewish persuasion receive that call first. And then it was passed to those in the highway and the byway, the Gentiles. Uh, but in the end, we're all called to Christian leadership. In verses 2 to 4, we see leaders called to serve, but they refuse to serve the call of God. That call of God is that nagging thing that will not leave you alone. Verses 5 to 7, the leaders made light of God's call in their life. What a terrible make light of the call of God. God made us. The God who made us is all powerful, all knowing. He loved us. He died for us and he's calling us. How could we be flippant about that? He died for us that we could take that call and yet we flippantly disregard it. Oh, I know I'm called to ministry, but I gotta put some money in the bank. I gotta get my kids through college. I gotta go home and bury my uh, parents. I have to. Uh, we see it in scripture. We see it today. Uh, we see people who ignore that call of God uh, and make light of it. And it's not something to be made light of. As we saw in, Ze in uh, Zechariah, we bring the wrath of God on us. And we see it again here. Scripture is consistent throughout. We see the same pattern. And in Zechariah, we saw people ignore that call of God and, uh, and bring uh, uh, Jesus. God's will is that all would be saved. When we ignore the call of God on our life, those who were to be saved might not be. However, I believe that the way of the Lord is, is bigger than our ways, and I believe that He will not be dependent on us. Uh, and as we see in His parable, He went and found someone else to get the message. But nonetheless, that wrath, that punishment for those people going to hell, rightfully belongs to us. Again, thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Aren't we glad we live after Christ and not before Christ? Can you imagine? And we saw it, you know, you see that, but look back, you know, whole civilization is wiped out. We see uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, we saw all the firstborn sons saved. We saw babies thrown in the river. We saw this wrath of God. Um, and, and we think that's horrible. And that's, but that's, that's what we deserve. We all deserve it. We're sons of Adam. The wrath that we bring on ourselves, although Jesus takes it, nonetheless, it's an area of weakness that's exposed to us. When we deny that call of leadership, we're exposing ourselves to the enemy. To the degree that we appropriate God's propitiation for our sin, we can, we can cover, we can put on the armor, armor of God. Uh, but if we're not aware of that, uh, and if we're not aware of the, the wiles, the 
of the devil and the weapons of the warfare, we expose ourselves. And I believe as Christians that, that Satan cannot attack us in a way that he doesn't have a right to. And this is one of the ways that we give Satan a uh, right to attack us. We see that with Job, where, where Satan went before God and he said, he said, you know, uh, I'm after Job. And, and it's not explicit, but there must have been areas in Job's life. We see it in the early part of Job where he's uh, worried about his children sinning and he's making sacrifices for his children and he's worrying. And, um, uh, you know, we see that in, 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 you know what, I'm getting ahead of myself in my message, aren't I? Uh, but that is an area, so that is an area that he was attacked in. We see him with his wealth and become very uh, concerned with his social position. And once again, we see that he's brought all the way down. Um, and so and we're going to see that as we go through this. I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, which is probably good because we're about done for tonight. Uh, but uh, uh, that is the way that Satan attacks us. And this is this in this area of leadership when we deny the God of the call of God on our lives, we're exposing ourselves to the enemy. Um, and I believe that you'll see that. That's the other thing I'm, I'm going to discuss the next two weeks. Uh, we can look around us. Uh, and I know, Pastor, even in the leadership of this church, uh, you know, we have been we have been attacked. Satan has attacked us, uh, and uh, I believe if you examine yourself, you'll find that he attacked you in your area of weakness. He'll he'll, he'll he he attacked you in the area that you really have faith in. And I pray as we go through this lesson and we look at the leaders in the Bible, the areas that they were they were attacked at, that for each of us it will show us areas that we're weak in, that we then need to make amends for. We need to appropriate Christ's work on the cross to cover those areas and the protection, the breastplate of righteousness. Where does that righteousness come from? Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. He is our salvation. It's not something where we go and make ourselves better. We can't make it better. Only He can. He can save us. He is Yeshua, God who saves. And he, he is that blessed breastplate of righteousness. Yes. Amen. Verses uh, 8 to 10, we've talked about uh, uh, if uh, a, a leader refuses God's call in his life, God's going to find somebody else. Uh, and Pastor, I think you, I've heard you preach on this before and, and literally had uh, someone who was told to build a church and then went and saw that church, and God had found someone else to build the exact same church that they were they were talked about. This is a truth in Scripture that we see over and over, and, and I believe that the uh, the parable in Matthew 22 uh, uh, makes that uh, uh, is a good illustration of that. Okay, Han, let's uh, let's go to the next uh, next slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the, uh, the dangers of shepherding, and we're going to go back to uh, Zechariah, which I was stuck in for three months, uh, so I know Zechariah well. Um, so we're going to go to Zechariah 13, um, and this is uh, somewhat of a parallel passage. Um, Zechariah 13 through 7, and it's talking about the spirit of Antichrist today, and really this is going to be the, the, the platform for what we're going to talk about the next two Wednesdays. Uh, verse 3 says, It shall come to pass that when ye shall prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say to him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. Oh, Jesus, help us, Lord. And it came to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed, every one of his vision. And when he hath proph prophesied, neither shall wear a rough garment to deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I'm a husbandman. For man hath taught me to keep cattle from my, from my youth. And one shall say to him, What are these wounds in thy hand? And then he shall answer, uh, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. God forbid. Awaken, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow saith the Lord of hosts, 
Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Verse 5 is, is a scripture that we saw Jesus quote. Um, one of the reasons that Christian leaders fail to fulfill the call of God on their lives is because of the attack. And we see here uh, very clearly the, the attack. And it is uh, a very ferocious attack. Uh, and it is typically uh, uh, brought into place as soon as people step into a position of leadership. And I know in uh, you know, my years as a Christian, I've seen it. Pastor, I'm sure you've seen it over and over and over again. Where someone someone begins to grow in Christ and they step into a position of leadership, not necessarily pastoral, but say they begin to uh, take over a singles ministry or they start a small group or they begin witnessing a church. And boom! And uh, so shepherding is dangerous business. Right? We saw that with Dave. David was the shepherd, right? And uh, David had to fight off lions and, uh, and bears with his bare hands. Uh, so shepherding is, is not something for, for cowards. Um, verse 3 speaks of a time when Christian leaders will be persecuted to death. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. It's at work today. It's been at work from the beginning. It was at work when Jesus was there. And it continues to be at work, and it will be at work until Christ returns and sends that spirit where it belongs. Uh, verse 4 shows us that those who were called, they were forsaking it because of the tremendous attack of the enemy. So in verse 3, we see uh, uh, the, the prophet speared by his own father and mother. So uh, this is uh, the dramatic example to make the point that even your own father and mother will kill you because you prophesy. You prophesy. The word prophesy is not necessarily speaking a prophecy, but it's also preaching. That was you become a prophet. Uh, speak as a prophet. Speak with the authority of God. Speak with the power of God in your life. Uh, and even your own mother and father will kill you for it. Uh, and we see that today. We see that today in the Muslim countries, especially uh, in India as well. So people kill uh, who are prophesying. Uh, so the spirit of Antichrist is, is alive today. Um, and there are people today, as it shows in verse 4, uh, that they uh, pretend like they don't have a call of God in their life. They deny Christ, just like Peter did. Uh, and they, they wear, it says, a rough garment, right? It says, no, I'm not a prophet. I'm, just, I'm, a, I'm a cowboy, a farmer. Right? Just a farmer. Uh, verse 5, it shows uh, them going so far as to deny that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this is not his will. He wants us to be one with him. Verse 6. So what are these nails in the hand? Right? The marks of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, Paul said, I, I, I bear the marks of Jesus Christ in my body. And the word says that uh, we are to take up our cross and follow him. And the word says that we're to be crucified with Christ and yet live. And so we as Christians bear those marks in our hand. Um, and so in this, you know, a practical modern day example would be, are you a Christian? Oh, well, no, you know, I work, uh, I work over in Loudoun County. I work over on Bowie Circle. Right? People will go so far, they'll be ashamed of the call of God on their life. Um, verse 7, once again, we see that the, the wrath of God. We see the anger of God uh, that, that's brought on this. Um, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is the fellow, says the Lord. We see the wrath of God. And, and once again, we see the exposure. Uh, these, are, uh, these verses are all saying the same thing in different ways. Uh, where we deny the call of God on our life, uh, we then call the wrath of God, and uh, fortunately we have Jesus Christ to take that wrath, but nonetheless it's, it's exposure. Uh, and uh, then we see the devil exposure.
So shepherding is dangerous business. Um, and, uh, uh, perhaps that's why the Lord uh, chose it uh, as an analogy of leadership. Um, the other uh, interesting uh, thing about choosing uh, shepherding is the analogy of leadership is that sh sheep are notoriously dumb. Uh, and has any, anyone heard the Ken Davis uh, thing on sheep? You can go, uh, I think it's on YouTube. Uh, go watch, go, go Google Ken Davis sheep. Uh, I think it's on his website. It's hilariously funny. He grew up on a sheep farm. And uh, he talks about how stupid sheep are. Uh, they will literally fall over and can't get up. Uh, if one of them walks off a cliff, they all fall over. Uh, they are the dumbest animal on the planet. And, and Ken Davis says, and I can't believe God called me a sheep. <laughs> He's entirely offended. Um, but that is the analogy that Christ used. Um, and so whose fault is it when the sheep get in problems? It's don't blame the sheep. Don't blame the sheep. It's the shepherd who are to blame. And I believe it's the shepherds. Of course, God holds everyone accountable. As we've seen, everyone who is born again in Christ is a leader. We are to lead. We're to rule and reign. We will be kings and queens uh, with the Lord as he reigns on earth. And we are leaders, uh, like it or not. We can choose to deny that call in our lives. And the bad news, we're going to face the wrath of God when we do that. It's taken by cross, but nonetheless, the devil will explode. Or we can choose to embrace the mantle of leadership. And we're going to see uh, in, in the, uh, two weeks from now, we're going to talk about the joy of leadership. And there truly is joy. Uh, there is a place that you can get to where uh, the, uh, the the joy of God uh, comes even as the, uh, the attacks of the enemy and the trials. Uh, and, and you can get to a place where even though you may be beaten and bruised uh, and persecuted, uh, the joy of the Lord is with you. And that comes through Jesus Christ not by our strength, but His. So God, we pray today that your word would bear fruit in our heart. We pray that you would help us to embrace the call that you put on our lives, Jesus. Come now, Lord. Come by your strength, Lord. And lift us up, Lord. We confess our inadequacy, Lord. We confess our failures, Jesus. We confess our weaknesses, Lord. But we also confess your word and your strength in our life, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have empowered us. You have equipped us. You've given us the rod and the staff. And the living water provides the power of God to bear much fruit. And help us to ask, Lord, to ask in your name that we might bear much fruit. Thank you, Jesus.